Ladies and gentlemen, good morning, chapter five of our Understanding International Relations lectures. We will have a look today at neo-Marxism, whose rise within the discipline is uh, directly linked uh, to the emergence of uh, third world countries. We saw last week uh, that Graham Allison, when analyzing uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis had established, had proposed two alternative models of foreign policy decision making, alternative to the then prevailing classical realist approach of foreign policy, which consisted in uh, positing the rationality of the statesman, the statesman himself embodying uh, the unitary uh, state. Edison's foreign policy models, alternative foreign policy models, permitted to emphasize the limits of this classical rational actor model. According to Edison, a statesman's decisions are uh, shaped, if not determined, by sociological uh, constraints, organizational constraints, standard patterns of behavior within uh, uh, the administration, and also bureaucratic uh, the constraints, processes, that is to say, bargaining among different uh, individual and collective members of an administration. And in doing so, Alison had uh, definitely uh, permitted the discipline to overcome the somehow common sense uh, conception of uh, a statesman being perfectly rational, of being uh, systematically guided by uh, uh, his capacity to define objectively what the national interest consisted in. That said, that said, Allison's models focused on the analysis of the decision-making processes in the US, the Kennedy administration, and in the USSR, Khrushchev's leadership. That is to say, Fidel Castro and Cuba, there where uh, the crisis, the Cuban Missile Crisis was located, were completely ignored neglected. That is to say, uh, though Allison's behaviorist approach criticized the rational actor model of the realists, he nevertheless shared with the realists the focus on major powers. That is to say, he considered merely major powers to be important actors on the world political scene. So he shared the same realist picture of international politics consisting mainly in struggles among major powers, the then a bipolar struggle opposing the US to the USSR. I think that there are two uh, major explanations to this neglect of Cuba or Castro. The first reason is an epistemological reason. That is to say, social scientists and therefore international relations scholars look at the world through their looking glasses, through their lenses, which are shaped by their non-scientific environment. A Western scholar looks at the world through Western uh, looking glasses. A male scholar, according to gender studies, looks at the world through a male masculine looking glasses. We will come back to this uh, uh, point in, in chapter nine, dealing with post-positivist approaches. In our concrete case, what th does this mean? This means that Allison was interested in America's security. And this security was likely to be, being an American scholar, and this security was likely to be threatened by the USSR and not by Cuba. So he ignored Cuba. He considered it to be a, a secondary actor. And he uh, favored uh, merely the US and the USSR because of the then bipolar confrontation. The second reason of um, the neglect of Cuba and of Castro and beyond Cuba, the greater part of humanity during the first decades of the Cold War, the second reason is an ontological one. Until uh, World War II, until 1945, and even in 1945 and during the first years following the end of World War II, well, the world was characterized by the two superpowers I mentioned, the US and the USSR, and by six 
colonial empires first and foremost, the British and the French empires, which amounts to saying that the rest of the world were still uh, not independent actors, were not independent actors yet, not sovereign states yet. Now the discipline of international relations, we saw this uh, in our introductory chapter, at least during the beginning of this uh, discipline, international relations was synonymous with relations among nation states, among independent sovereign states. By definition, therefore, uh, colonial entities which were part of colonial empires and which therefore were not independent, these colonial uh, territories were not considered uh, to be actors on the international scene. Which amounts to saying also, ladies and gentlemen, that in order for these units, for these uh, entities to be taken into consideration, they first had to become independent and also they first had to become somehow important, somehow significant actors. This emergence then occurred during the decolonization process, which gave birth within the discipline of international relations to a new approach, Marxism and more specifically neo-Marxism, whose objective was to analyze specifically the international uh, relations of these emerging southern countries or third world countries as they were called a little bit later. They were interested in analyzing and explaining the political and above all the economic uh, international relations of these uh, third world countries. We therefore first have to have a look at this historical background before going into the details of Marxism and then all the more so of neo the Marxists might come back to the difference in a few minutes. So the historical background first. You may know that nowadays the United Nations uh, is composed by 193 member states, independent sovereign nations. In 1945, when the UN was created, there were only 51 founding members and I should even specify that, strictly speaking, there were 49 because among the 51, Ukraine and Belarus were considered as founding members, though they were part of uh, the USSR, they were not independent states. Anyway, these uh, 51 or 49 member states were located in Europe and in the Western Hemisphere, North and South America. The most important part of the rest of the world, be it um, the near Middle East, be it uh, Southeast uh, India, um, Asia, with uh, India including, uh, included, and Africa, the more so, were not independent. They were part of uh, colonial empires. And things changed gradually uh, during uh, a decolonization process, which pretty often went through a very uh, violent wars of independence. The majority of states or former colonies became states uh, throughout the 50s and the 60s. India, Pakistan, Indonesia, Israel too, a bit earlier, between 1945 and 1949. Um, Vietnam in 1954, after its war of independence against France. Uh, the majority of North African states during the 50s and Algeria even later in 1962. The majority of African, Black African states uh, around 1960, 58, 59 to 62, 63. The Middle East, oil uh, monarchies uh, became um, independent in 71, and the former uh, Portuguese uh, colonies in Southern Africa, as late as in the midst of the 1970s. This decolonization process was possible uh, thanks uh, mainly to uh, two uh, reasons. The former colonial powers, mainly the British and uh, the French, were no longer major powers after 1945, though they belonged uh, indirectly regarding France. Uh, to the winners, to the victors of World War II, they were uh, no more powerful enough. They were weakened by uh, World War II, and therefore they could no longer reject the claims to independence emanating uh, from uh, the still uh, colonized uh, populations at that time. Though they tried to do so, this explains that uh, 
sometimes the uh, independence process was a very violent one in Algeria, in Kenya, in Madagascar, in Indonesia, in India, etc. On the other hand, second reason, the two new superpowers, the US and the USSR, were opposed uh, to colonialism or to neo-colonialism. They were opposed to colonialism, the USSR, because of its proclaimed uh, anti-imperialist ideology, and the US, because of its own past, it had become independent thanks to a war of independence against uh, the British colonial master uh, at the end of the 18th century. That said, the two major superpowers were also anti-colonialist in order to profit, to some extent, uh, from the decline of the former uh, colonial powers, France and Great Britain. Their aim was to some extent uh, to, to, to grasp this opportunity to enlarge their own sphere of influence in the former uh, colonial territories of uh, the British and the French. The newly independent states were aware, of course, of this somehow ambiguous attitude of both the Americans and the Soviets. And thus, they came to the conclusion that, to some extent, they wanted to be neither part of the Eastern Bloc or uh, nor of the Western camp. Since they were different from the first world of the Western liberal democracies, but also uh, from the second world of uh, the socialist or communist Eastern European countries, they conceived of themselves to form the so-called third world. This expression, ladies and gentlemen, you may know this, was proposed at the very beginning of the 1950s by a French uh, sociologist, historian, or demographer, Alfred Sauvy, in an article published in the French magazine, L'Observateur. Um, Alfred Sauvy made a comparison between uh, the former uh, French society during uh, uh, the monarchy, where the French society was divided into the first, the second, the third estate, uh, clergy, clergymen from the first estate, aristocrats, the second one, and the commoners, uh, the bourgeois, uh, from the third estate. And he applies then uh, this uh, uh, typology uh, to the world. There is the first world, there is the second world, and there is the third world, which is forgotten because everybody, as we saw this last week, focuses on either the first or and the second world. The third world is forgotten. Now, this third world, I quote Alfred Sauvy, ignored, exploited, schooled by the first and by the second world, like the third estate that was dominated by the first and the second estate in pre-revolutionary France, this third world wants to be something too. It no longer wants to be the object of both the first and the second world. What did then the third world countries do in order to escape the bipolar logic and therefore uh, to some extent the bipolar domination of which they were uh, the victims? These third world countries tried to um, start a unification process. They, they tried to launch a unified political movement in order, of course, to defend their specific interests on the world political stage. The first step in order to do so uh, was the so-called Bandung Conference, also called Afro-Asian or Asian African conference held in Bandung, a city in Indonesia in 1955, 1955, that is to say one year after France's defeat against Vietnam in the war of China. And the most important statesmen attending this conference were the Egyptian Nasser, uh, the head of India, Nehru, who had succeeded to Gandhi, Sukarno, the head, uh, the statesman at the head of uh, Indonesia and China, the communist China's number two, uh, Chun Lai. This conference, ladies and gentlemen, was a milestone to uh, the creation of the non aligned movement, created in 1961 in Belgrade during the non aligned movement, Belgrade, the capital of uh, Yugoslavia. And Yugoslavia uh, it was 
then only Eastern European countries that was not part of the Soviet bloc. It had managed, Tito had managed uh, to get rid of uh, Stalin's uh, control of Stalin's domination without uh, becoming a member of the Western Alliance of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. So he, Tito, to some extent, proved that it was possible to be non aligned to be part neither of the West nor of the East. At the very beginning of the 60s, China uh, no longer was active among the then third world countries, and therefore uh, the non aligned movement uh, was organized uh, beyond Tito uh, by Nasser, Nero, and Sukarno, and also by an important African uh, leader, uh, Nkrumah, the head of uh, states of Ghana. During this non-aligned movement, the countries concerned um, proclaimed two major objectives, two sets of major objectives that they were eager uh, to uh, pursue. First of all, they wanted, I quote, to promote a national independence, a sovereignty, territorial integrity, and security of the non-aligned countries. And secondly, they wanted to struggle against what? Against imperialism, against colonialism and neo-colonialism, against racism, against all forms of foreign aggression, corruption, occupation, domination, interference, and also against block great power and block politics, that is to say against the two uh, Eastern and Western blocks or camps. These were the objectives pursued and beyond the country's concerns, some left-wing scholars and also left-wing activists, politicians, sympathized with the Third World Movement. In the discipline then of international relations, these left-wing uh, sympathizers who were uh, scholars or theorists were Marxists, inspired scholars. And given that they belong to a new generation of Marxists, they called themselves neo-Marxists. And their aim then was to study scientifically the position, the situation of these third world countries within the then existing world political system. They can be divided, these Marxists, in three major groups, the Latin American Dependencia School, uh, the peace research mainly represented by the Norwegian scholar Johan Galtun, and the so-called world system theory proposed notably by the North American Immanuel Wallerstein or Wallerstein. These authors are neo-Marxists, that is to say they are Marxists, but a different kind, a new kind of Marxists. They are Marxists, why? Because like Marxists in general, just as Marxists in general, they consider that the basic factor which determines all the rest, both in national and international politics, is the economic factor. Marxists consider economy to be the basis and politics, culture, law, ideology is the superstructure determined by the basis of the economic infrastructure. There is a kind of economic determinism characterizing Marxism, at least uh, the original Marxism. And these Marxists then of the 60s, of the 70s, of the 80s to some extent, when in the discipline of uh, neo-Marxism was somehow uh, successful temporarily, we we'll come back to this point, these Marxists were neo-Marxists because they somehow were different from classical original Marxists for two reasons. First, they were interested in analyzing economic international relations among politically independent units and no longer as classical Marxists has done um, economic relations among social classes within single countries at the domestic level, and to put it differently. And the second difference is that these neo-Marxists, all the more so, the most important, or the first among them came from southern countries. They, had, they no longer had the Eurocentric view, which characterized 
uh, the classical Marxists, at least uh, throughout the 19th century up to uh, Lenin. Let's then, ladies and gentlemen, first have a look at the original Marxist approach in international relations, and then uh, we will come to uh, the neo Marxist generation of neo Marxists within the discipline of international relations during roughly uh, one generation from the mid of the 60s to the mid of the 80s. Marx himself, and when I uh, say Marx, I think of Marx and of Engels. They uh, collaborated and published many uh, books or essays or, 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 or other publications together. During their lifetime, Marx and Engels wrote a quantitatively important number of pages uh, dealing with international politics for the very simple reason that in order to, uh, to, to survive uh, in the then uh, Prussian uh, dominated uh, Germany, they were freelance contributors to German and also to North American uh, newspapers. And in their articles uh, to earn some money, uh, they commented on the Crimean war on uh, regarding international politics, they commanded on the Crimean War, on the wars of the Italian and the German unification, on the, uh, the American War of Secession, the Civil War in the US. They focused on the Eastern question, the decline of the Ottoman Empire, and also on the great game uh, opposing the British to the Russians in Central Asia. The Friedrich Engels is known for having written a short article about Afghanistan, where he emphasized the fact that never Afghan tribes would accept to be dominated by a foreign a country, which at that time was Great Britain. The Soviets learned the experience in the 1980s and the Americans learned this experience too, uh, up to some months ago when Biden decided to withdraw the American troops from Afghanistan after 20 years of American presence, the longest war in American history. So Marx and Engels wrote many articles uh, commenting on the then international political events, but, but these articles can hardly be considered to be a scientific analysis. Why? Because Marx and Engels, due to their basic uh, philosophy, their basic general philosophy, considered economy to be more important than the politics which was part of the superstructure, both domestic politics and international politics was mere a superstructure determined by uh, economic, uh, the economic mode or the economic process of uh, production. They therefore uh, focused on uh, the study of economy, the economic uh, processes, and first and foremost in Europe, because the European countries, Great Britain, Germany, France, were the most advanced, developed, industrialized economies. This means, ladies and gentlemen, that to, um, to have access uh, to uh, the original Marxist uh, conception of international relations, we have to look for it indirectly, that is to say, uh, within his uh, more general social theory uh, founded on Marxist uh, historical materialism. This uh, general theory, ladies and gentlemen, is um, inherently um, global, uh, that is a non-state centric, uh, an important difference uh, when compared to realism. Uh, you know, the most famous of all uh, Marxist uh, phrases or slogans, uh, proletarians of the world unite, uh, workers of all countries unite. You immediately see that uh, the world is what Marx is interested in, not uh, different powers. And uh, you also see, thanks to this quote, that Marx considers social classes to be the most important actors, not uh, states embodied in the statesman. According to Marx and according to Engels, uh, the social class struggle is the engine of history. In the past, in ancient times, masters were opposed to slaves. During the Middle Ages, the European Middle Ages, feudal lords were opposed to serfs. And 
since the rise of capitalism, bourgeois, the bourgeois class or the capitalist class is opposed uh, to the proletarians. And this fundamental process characterized by a class a struggle will sooner or later, because of the inherent contradictions of the capitalist mode of production, will provoke the outbreak of a social revolution staged by the workers or by the political parties uh, representing the workers. Therefore, Marx created the International Working Man's Association, which will become the different communist parties uh, in the 20th century. And this social revolution will uh, uh, permit uh, through uh, the dictatorship of the proletarians and the socialist a stage will permit in the end uh, the rise, the triumph of a classless, of a communist society. Um, the process of uh, the victorious socialist revolution will also be indirectly favored by the foreign policy of capitalist state. And here then is the link with our discipline of international relations. According to Marx, uh, the foreign policy actions of states, of the then European states, does not pursue, these actions do not pursue the national interest. There is no such thing as a national interest, according to Marxists. The foreign policy of the then European states pursued the private interests of the dominating class within each of these states, that is to say, of the dominating bourgeois or capitalist class. What was then the interest of the capitalist class in the then European societies? Their interest consisted in enlarging their market in order to sell their goods, in order to purchase raw materials, uh, less expensive raw materials, notably overseas, which amounts to saying that according to Karl Marx, the colonial wars fought by the then European powers, notably the British and the, France, and the French, and a bit later, the Belgians, the, the, the Germans, etc. These colonial wars were actually wars fought by European powers in order to satisfy the private interests of the capitalists, of the capitalists. And here then we come to a very, I may say, ambiguous uh, stance of Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels' uh, theory. That is to say, how they perceived and how they uh, analyzed these colonial wars. From a moral point of view, Karl Marx was aware, of course, of the horrible consequences for the native populations, for the indigenous populations overseas, the negative consequences of these colonial wars, which meant uh, destruction, death, diseases for uh, these populations. But from a somehow scientific point of view, the Marxist scientific point of view, Marx and Engels uh, emphasized that the conquest of non-capitalist uh, entities was a necessary stage in the development, the worldwide development of the capitalist mode of production, which itself was the condition of the contradictions of the capitalist mode of production becoming worldwide, thus favoring the socialist revolution worldwide. To put it differently, the colonial conquest was a necessary step in the process towards the definitive triumph of the classless communist society. And uh, this explains uh, why Marx and Engels ultimately uh, appreciated, uh, agreed with what the Europeans did overseas. I would like to quote uh, two. Um, somehow disturbing the quotes by uh, Marx and Engels, since they were, uh, sim they had sympathies for the European proletarians, we might somehow expect that they would have had sympathies for the non-white uh, populations who were the victims of the capitalist Europeans too. Actually, 
their vision was absolutely Eurocentric. For instance, when commenting on the war that the United States fought against Mexico in order to conquer those territories that became the Southern uh, American, uh, Southern US states from Florida to California, which had been part of Mexico and before Mexico, of the Spanish colonial empire, of course, this is what the Karl Marx wrote. In America, we witnessed the conquest of Mexico and we have rejoiced at it. He asked the question, is the misfortune uh, that magnificent California was seized from the lazy Mexicans, the lazy Mexicans who did not know what to do with it. And then the typical European centered uh, analysis, it is to the interest of its own development that Mexico will be placed under the tutelage of the US. It is in its own interest that Mexico or Northern Mexican territories that became the Southern US states, Florida, uh, Texas, uh, New Mexico, Colorado, Arizona, Utah, and Nevada and California, it is in their interest that they should be conquered and uh, dominated by the US because the US is economically developed, which will permit the socialist revolution to end up triumphing in a more or less faraway future. And the same is true for uh, Marx and Engels commenting on the British conquest of India. England has, a, has to fulfill a double mission in India. One destructive, the British should destroy annihilate, this is the term used, the old Asiatic society, and it should lay the foundations, the material foundations of Western society in Asia. The question therefore is not whether England has the right or not to conquer India. The question that we should ask is whether it is lucky for India to be conquered by India rather than by uh, the, the Russians or the Persians or the Turks. So a very typical Eurocentric uh, conception, viewpoint, which was shared at that time by all uh, the European intellectual elites or political elites, rather Kipling, uh, the British poet and novelist in his uh, uh, white band's burden uh, poem claimed that it belonged to the Europeans uh, to spread the civilization or, or the capitalist mode of production in order uh, to permit history uh, to move towards the end of history, the yes, end of history is different uh, depending on the authors, be they liberals such as Kipping or John Stuart Mill, or be they revolutionaries such as Marx and Engels. But the vision is exactly the same. History is on the move uh, towards the end of history, and the Europeans shall show the non Europeans how to proceed in order to become rich, uh, prosperous, and uh, in order to enjoy uh, a peaceful life. This uh, Eurocentric vision, ladies and gentlemen, will be uh, abandoned two generations later within uh, Marxism. It will be abandoned uh, thanks to Lenin, uh, the Russian revolutionary uh, who uh, in 1917 uh, published his famous imperialism at the highest stage of uh, capitalism. Lenin is the first Marxist to drop the Eurocentric vision, the Western-centric vision. That is to say, to propose a somehow critical analysis of the then existing relations between the capitalist West, the capitalist states, and the uh, then uh, colonial entities dominated uh, by uh, the Europeans. And this, uh, in, this analysis was influenced by the difficulties that he himself as a revolutionary had uh, in Russia with the non-Russian peoples in the southern part of the then Russian empire and in uh, Siberia, in the central Asian part of the Russian empire, which will become uh, the Soviet Union. So Lenin abandoned the original Marxist analysis and considered that the opposition uh, between capitalist states and colonial uh, territories was on the international scale uh, exactly uh, the same struggle that within the different countries opposed the capitalist class to the proletariat. That is to say, on the international scale, 
the colonial entities were the proletarians of the world, while on the international scale, the capitalist countries were the capitalists of uh, the different uh, uh, Western developed states. He therefore considered imperialism, which was the new term given to colonialism, he therefore considered imperialism to be no longer a positive necessary stage within a long evolution moving, uh, permitting uh, uh, the socialist uh, revolution to triumph. He considered imperialism rather to be an inherently negative process for, of course, uh, the colonial uh, populations concerned. This shift was due to his own need uh, to obtain the support of the colonial non-Russian peoples and nations, uh, pretty often Muslim nations, in the Caucasus and in Central Asia. But whatever uh, his intentions, they were much more political than scientific or intellectual or academic, whatever his intentions, he discovered to some extent the revolutionary role that the wretched of the earth, to use a term that was coined in the 1950s, that the wretched of the earth, the proletarians of the world overseas could play uh, from a Marxist point of view. In doing so, he paved the way to what would become the neo-Marxist approach, also analyzing the world in terms of the core and the periphery of the world uh, economy. This neo-Marxist approach, ladies and gentlemen, will emerge in the discipline of international relations at the end of the 60s, the beginning of the 70s. That is to say, almost and actually precisely 50 and even more than 50 years after Lenin's imperialism, the highest stage of capitalism, which was uh, published uh, in 1917. 50 years, uh, during these 50 long years, Marxism did not exist in the discipline of international relations. There was kind of mutual neglect. The discipline of international relations was not interested in Marxism, but Marxists were not interested in international relations, in studying international uh, relations. How can we explain this mutual neglect. First of all, we have to emphasize the fact that in the USSR, the first state that became communist and that referred to Marxist analysis via Lenin's interpretation of this analysis, the USSR itself turned totalitarian under Stalin's regime. There was no more Marxist analysis, but a Marxist somehow ossified ideology. And the aim of this ideology was to justify a Stalin's foreign policy, or Stalin's policy in general, and foreign policy more particularly. The aim was no more than to analyze scientifically uh, how the world uh, worked. So the Marxist the theory, which to some extent had always been a doctrine, now became an ideology. And its aim was to justify Stalin's uh, doctrine and Stalin's practice of socialism if in one country and no more the spread of the socialist revolution. What's more, the discipline emerged in Western countries, first in the UK, we saw this in chapter two, then it became an independent, uh, important discipline in the US after 1945. Now the US and the UK were the adversaries of the USSR. The USSR was perceived to be the enemy, which means that everything that was somehow reminding Marxism, even the communist ideology, which was no longer genuinely Marxist to some extent, uh, everything that reminded uh, Marxism was rejected in the Western uh, country in the Western states and therefore also in the Western universities. So the Western discipline of international relations was not interested in Marxist, in critical Marxist analysis. After 1945, ladies and gentlemen, Marxism uh, suffered from another limit, another flaw, given that it focused on the economic factor, given that it considered uh, the original Marxist approach that economy uh, determined politics, it could hardly uh, be relevant uh, to account for the then uh, prevailing 
international political process, which was the bipolar power political and military uh, confrontation opposing the Soviets in the USSR. You can hardly explain uh, the nuclear arms race by focusing on uh, economic mode of production. So during two decades or so, Marxism was not relevant, was not credible, because it was unable uh, to account for the then uh, prevailing uh, international political uh, process, the bipolar uh, confrontation. This then contributes to explain that Marxists that existed in social sciences uh, focused on philosophy, on uh, economy, on history, on uh, political science or sociology, but hardly on international uh, relations. They were not interested in uh, studying international uh, politics. Things began to change, notably in the 1960s, from the 1960s onwards, because of a new historical background, as usual. Three uh, changes, three evolutions occurred first, uh, the Cold War and that in the period of detente after uh, the peaceful end of the Cuban Missile Crisis that we saw last week. Since uh, the Cold War was now characterized by what will be called the period of detente entente and cooperation, we'll come back to this in our two next uh, chapters too, um, the non-military uh, uh, dimensions were rediscovered to some extent because of the decline of the immediate uh, threat emanating from uh, the military confrontation. The non-military dimension and therefore to some extent the economic dimension was gradually considered to be important. This was the first uh, change. The second change, the second evolution was the fact that during the 60s the socialist movement seemed uh, to irresistibly gaining ground. Remember uh, Che Guevara, and his appeal to many Western leftists. Remember the student revolts on American campuses in France, May uh, 68, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And last but not least, formally, we saw this uh, at the beginning of today's chapter, a formally uh, colonial uh, territory became independent. Uh, the rise of the Third World started in the 1960s. The non aligned movement was created. They aimed at being independent from both the West and the East. And it is the third world's situation position in uh, on the world political stage, which is at the origin of the interest taken by a new generation of Marxist inspired scholars, which is at the origin of uh, the success of neo-Marxism in the discipline of international relations. They were interested in explaining first and foremost the economic underdevelopment of the third world state. These neo-Marxists should be divided into three major approaches. The first one is the Latin American dependencia, school Latin American at the beginning and then non-American authors joined their analysis. Dependencia School, um, the starting point of these uh, Latin American scholars was the then situation of Latin America. You know that the Latin American countries had become independent by getting rid of the Spanish colonial presence. In the 1820s, Simon Bolivar managed to oust the Spaniards. So the political independence of the Latin American states was achieved in 1820, in the, 19, in the 1820s. But 140 or 50 years later, they still were economically underdeveloped, despite being politically free, independent, or sovereign. This underdevelopment, ladies and gentlemen, had been explained by what we may call mainstream economic scholars or economic historians. First and foremost, the American. Walt Rostov, who had proposed an analysis of economic growth in five uh, stages, the five stages of economic growth model. According to uh, Walt Rostov, uh, economies go through uh, five stages. They first are uh, traditional societies, then emerge preconditions of economic growth, then uh, takes place what he calls the economic takeoff, then uh, 
um, the drive to maturity, and last but not least, the mass consumption phase or stage, which is the one that characterizes Western societies when he wrote his book in the 1960s. And according to Rostov, Latin American countries were unable, had been unable when he wrote his book, uh, to go through these five stages. They still were at the very first stage of traditional societies. Why? Because according to him, Earth, uh, the kind of uh, traditional mentalities and attitudes, Catholic aristocratic mentalities that were prevailing in Latin America, according to him, there were no private initiatives similar to what had occurred uh, notably in Protestant uh, countries, uh, England, uh, the US, Germany, or even in less Protestant Catholic entities such as the France. This approach then was gradually criticized by Latin American scholars. Enrique Cardoso who was a Marxist professor before becoming uh, the president of Brazil in the 1990s. And a Marxist professor uh, is never a Marxist president. This is a personal remark. Uh, Seto Furtado from Chile, Andre Gunda Frank, an Argentinian a scholar. Their explanation is the following one. If uh, the Latin American economies are underdeveloped, under it's because they are dependent from the Northern Western developed economies. That is to say, they suffer, they are victims from what they call a structural uh, dependence. Since they are integrated in the world economy, which is dominated by the capitalist countries, the US, the UK, Germany, etc., the Latin American countries themselves are dominated because they are dependent. And then these authors, joined by the Egyptian Samir Amin and by the Greek Argiri Emmanuel, will propose their analysis in terms of core and periphery. There is a world economy dominated by the core, which is composed by the developed economies of the West, and a periphery, which is dominated, uh, periphery composed by the third world economies, the underdeveloped economies, dominated and exploited by the core economies. Exploited how? Well, the process is the following one. Southern economies, but the term southern economies is not used by these neo Marxists. They use the term periphery. The economies of the periphery are underdeveloped, and they are underdeveloped because they have to sell their agricultural goods or products and the raw materials that can be found on the territories. They have to sell them to the Western developed economies in exchange of the manufactured products that they have to import. And in doing so, they endlessly reproduce the dependence of these economies from the core economies. In doing so, they endlessly reproduce the underdevelopment. I mean, uh, Frank. But wrote a short essay, the development of underdevelopment. The more they have commercial exchanges with Western developed economies, the more they are underdeveloped. It's a vicious circle. And then the only way, the only means uh, to escape this dependency is to de-link their economies from the capitalist economies. So they say to have no more a trade, that is to say, to favor a self-centered development strategy. This was the political or economic recommendation made notably by Samir Amin to de-link the economy, no more to export or to import, but to uh, uh, favor a self-centered development strategy. The core periphery model, ladies and gentlemen, will be revisited and refined by the Norwegian scholar Johan Galtung. At the head of the so-called peace research uh, school, a Nordic, Norwegian, or more general Scandinavian approach of international relations. 
Johann Galtung is known in discipline of international relations first for his concept of structural imperialism. Not merely does he use the term imperialism, which goes back to Lenin, but he add, adds the adjective structural, so structural imperialism. And he, he, in doing so, he combines uh, the traditional Marxist analysis with the analysis of the dependencia, the neo-Marxist dependencia. Very concretely, structural imperialism designates the fact that there are uh, capitalists and proletarians, both in Western developed countries and in southern underdeveloped countries. And that is to say, he applies the original Marxist analysis of the class struggle opposing the bourgeois to the proletariats in developed economies, he transfers it to assert that there is also a class struggle in the underdeveloped countries between the dominating bourgeois class in these countries and the dominated or exploited proletarian class in these uh, countries of the periphery. What's more, he claims that the core, within the core, exploits the periphery, within the core, the core in the periphery exploits the periphery in the periphery, but there is a harmony of interests, a shared interest between the two capitalist classes, of the north and the south, or of the core at the periphery. They have common interests, but there are no common interests between the proletarians in the northern countries of the capitalist developed states. There are no common interests between these proletarians and the proletarians in the periphery of the underdeveloped countries. That is to say, it is impossible for a socialist world revolution to be staged by all the proletarians of the core and of the periphery. And because of this disharmony of interest between the two types of proletarians in the core and in the periphery, the imperialist structure of the world economy will be endlessly reproduced and it will profit both to the capitalists of the core and to the capitalists of the periphery. And there will also be no national revolution within uh, the countries of the periphery because of the disharmony of interest between the core, the dominating class in the periphery and the periphery, the dominated proletarian class in the periphery. So no possibility of any kind of revolution at all, neither a nationalist revolution, of the southern countries against the western ones, nor a socialist revolution of the two dominated class, classes against their dominating class taken together. So imperialism will be endlessly reproduced. This is the first contribution of Johann Galtung. And this first contribution should be linked to his second contribution, which precisely regards the peace research that he launched, and more specifically, his conception or his definition of peace, and therefore of violence. According to Galtung, peace exists when there is no violence. This is somehow a mainstream, but he has a very specific radical conception of violence. As you can see on the slide, the left part of the slide, violence exists according to, uh, to Galtung, this is his definition, when a human beings, a potential, uh, when the human beings actual effective achievements are inferior, are inferior to his or her potential achievements. That is to say, when the existing social structure uh, prevents a human being from doing all his or her capacities should permit him or her to do. In other words, violence is as much structural as necessarily 
a physical. Violence is as much a psychological as it is physical. There is as much voluntary violence as non-voluntary violence. Manifest and latent, personal and anonymous. Peace, therefore, can only exist when there is no more structural violence. Peace, to some extent, is synonymous with social justice, when everybody is allowed to achieve what his or her capacities permit him or her to achieve. And this is not possible in the different uh, societies, and it is not possible on the international stage. If we establish the link between his two contributions, Imperial, structural imperialism and a positive peace, we can come to the conclusion that the societies of the periphery are victims of structural violence on behalf of uh, the dominating uh, Western economies or Western societies. There is a structural dominance, domination, violence exerted by uh, the countries of the periphery upon the society, the countries of the core upon the peripheries of the societies, because of the periphery, because the, the societies in the periphery are prevented from achieving what they might achieve if there were no such structural violence, structural domination exerted by uh, the Western societies. And to some extent, this is still true nowadays. The southern societies are dependent on the core the countries or the core economies of the core uh, societies regarding mm, the economic goods that they produce thanks to our industries which accept uh, to uh, uh, establish their our their um, plans in the countries concerned the countries of the periphery the societies of the per peripheries somehow have to import our Western values, human rights, uh, separation of power, uh, plural elections, etc. The financial aid that they obtain depends on our willingness uh, to give them our financial aid, etc., etc. So Galtung's analysis is a very radical analysis, the most radical among the neo-Marxists, and I can help for thinking, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> that it still is relevant, notably, uh, to analyze the relations between France and uh, the French Precaré in Africa. France-Afrique is probably the very best illustration of what we may call uh, the structural imperialist model of uh, Johann Galtung. So very radical approach, which is no more, I would say, uh, very close to the original Marxist theory because economy is just one element among others. Same is true, ladies and gentlemen, for the very last representative of neo-Marxism in the discipline of international relations, the American Emmanuel Wallerstein and his so-called world system theory inspired uh, by uh, the French uh, historian Fernand Brodel who coined uh, the term of économie monde, world uh, economy. Emmanuel Wallerstein um, proposes a new expression, world system, to be distinguished from international system. Here again, you see the non-state centric approach, typical of all Marxists and neo-Marxists. And according to Emmanuel Wallerstein, when we look at the historical evolution of the world, there have been existing two types of world systems. What is a world system, ladies and gentlemen? It is a, a set of social entities, more or less uh, large, geographically speaking. And uh, within uh, these social entities, uh, the units uh, do entertain privileged relationships among each other in every domain, economic, political, cultural. And according to, uh, uh, I give you concrete examples which will permit you to better understand, within uh, this uh, world systems, there are two types world empires and world economies. World empires existed in the past and they were characterized by one imperial entity dominating the world system, the then world system. The definition is pretty close to 
the, um, the definition of empire that I gave you in the introductory class, the Roman Empire, the Chinese Empire, are examples of world empires. World economies is a more innovative concept. A world economy is a world system characterized by independent political units. They are politically independent, but they are economically integrated in a world economy because of economic, uh, commercial, and financial relations. So in the past, an example would be the Phoenician civilization in ancient times, uh, or the Hanseatic League in the Middle Ages, the ports going from today's Belgium uh, to uh, today's Baltic states via Rotterdam, uh, via Hamburg in Germany, Bremen, etc., etc. According to uh, Wallerstein, Wallerstein, uh, German origin. Um, the contemporary world system is a world economy and is more specifically a capitalist world economy, which is composed by uh, a core, a periphery, and he adds a semi-periphery. He makes a distinction uh, between the periphery and the semi-periphery, that is to say there are some economies which are no longer in the periphery, but which are not yet, or maybe which will never uh, be able to uh, uh, be developed sufficiently to uh, enter uh, the core of the world economy. This capitalist world economy emerged at the end of the Renaissance period in uh, Northern Italy. It uh, developed along the Rhine River up to the Flanders, crossed uh, to some extent uh, the channel uh, the UK became the most important core in the world economy during the 19th century before it crossed uh, the Atlantic Ocean. The US nowadays is dominating the contemporary capitalist world economy. This world economy, and this is the link with mainstream international relations theories, this capitalist world economy is both hierarchical and anarchical. It is anarchical, politically speaking. All the different states are independent. And to some extent, the different economies, the national economies, the German, British, uh, French, Japanese, uh, American economies are, are rivals. They are competitors. But there is also hierarchy due to the hierarchy among the economic hierarchy among these different economies. And nowadays it is the hegemonic economy of the US, which is dominating. When Wallerstein was proposing analysis, that his analysis, that is to say, uh, in the midst of the 70s and throughout the 80s. The US is dominating, and this permits the world economy to remain stable, despite the competition. There is no risk of these economic uh, rivalries to aggravate in order uh, to create a war which could be the consequence of anarchy. Remember uh, what the realists uh, said, uh, we saw this in chapter three. So the today's economy, today's world economy, according to uh, uh, Wallerstein, is dominated by a hegemonic power, a hegemonic economic power, the US, and therefore it is a stable world the American hegemony uh, permits the world economy and the world uh, system, the political dimension of this economy, uh, to uh, avoid any somehow uh, major war, which uh, of course would put an end, would put an end to the prosperity of the capitalist world economy. One of them, then, ladies and gentlemen, is to some extent the only neo-Marxist uh, author who accepts to build a bridge uh, towards mainstream approaches, starting from, we saw this, the concept of anarchy as being the specific characteristic of international uh, relations. Therefore, we might have uh, expected that Wallerstein's approach would be very successful since to some extent he accepts to talk to mainstream scholars focusing on anarchy. The problem, however, and to some extent, he was indeed acknowledged by mainstream American scholars. 
as an important uh, art theorist. Unfortunately, however, for, for Wallerstein, he proposed his approach at the end of the 70s, beginning of the 80s, when gradually uh, Marxism was declining in the discipline of international relations. Marxism was declining uh, for uh, different reasons and no, mainly uh, because of the evolution of world politics, an evolution which refuted uh, which refuted the, the claims and the explanations of uh, neo Marxism. First of all, the first refutation, the first empirical reality which belied the Marxist analysis was the fact that some third world countries were able to get out of their underdeveloped uh, stage the underdeveloped stage of their economy. They were able to grow economically. The dragons, so-called dragons of East Asia, the tigers, the baby dragons, the baby tigers, as you say, Taiwan, Hong Kong, uh, Singapore, uh, a bit later, um, Vietnam, um, Malaysia, not to mention India, China, of course, but also Turkey, Brazil. Economy is considered to be part of the periphery, according to neo Marxists, were able to grow. And more important, they were able to grow not by adopting the self centered strategy that had been recommended by Samir Amin and other neo Marxist scholars. No, they were able to grow economically by integrating the world market by selling on the world economic markets the products, somehow technological products that they were able to produce. So this was a refutation of the economic analysis of the neo-Marxists. What's more, second reason of the decline of Marxism in the discipline of international relations, a political reason. The uh, neo Marxists, of course, recommended to the third world countries to remain united politically on the international scene. But what happened? Well, this unity did not last pretty long. Why? Because within the non aligned movement, some countries were very close to the USSR. Because of their somehow Marxist regimes, this was the case of Cuba, as we saw last week, this was the case of Vietnam after getting rid of the Americans in the 70s. This was the case of Algeria. So pro-Moscow uh, countries, and therefore many non-aligned countries were scared by the perspective of their non-aligned movement controlled by Moscow. It was no longer genuinely non-aligned. And of course, within the non-aligned uh, movement, there were some countries who felt very close to the West. Saudi Arabia was close to the US. Many African countries were close to France. They were not happy with the Marxist orientation of some third world countries. So there was no more political unity, all the less so various wars broke out among third world countries. Uh, Iraq versus Iran, 1980, 1988, um, an eight year long war. Uh, Vietnam invaded Cambodia to put an end to the genocide staged by the Red Khmers in Cambodia. Ethiopia uh, went to war against Somalia, uh, etc. in the Horn of Africa. Some examples of violent conflicts among third world countries, no more political unity. So both the political and economic evolution belied, refuted. Uh, Marxism and Marxism therefore lost any scientific credibility within the discipline of international relations. This explains even before the Cold War, or the more so after the definitive collapse of the USSR, which was the major power referring to its version of Marxism. Ever since then, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Marxism has turned, uh, has uh, remained very, very marginal in the discipline of international relation. We could conclude in saying that among all uh, the social scientific uh, disciplines, uh, international relations is probably the least Marxist friendly one.
Thank you very much for listening to today's class, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I wish you a great day and hope uh, you come back for uh, chapter six, where we will have a look at transnationalism, which uh, started the debate uh, with Marxism and with the then still prevailing realism within the so-called inter-paradigmatic uh, debate. Uh, see you pretty soon.